Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 16 of my beta campaign. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I love getting stuff for free. And if I can get stuff with no effort whatsoever, that is even better. So take this as an example. Here I have a contract to go collect some science from, uh, from around the moon. And as it turns out, I happen to have a mapping satellite that I have yet to collect the science from. And so, yeah, it was a pretty simple matter to grab this contract, zip on over to that satellite, transmit back some science. Yeah, free is always good. But let's move on to something a little bit more interesting. And here we have Jeb in the Aristarchus. And guess what? He he is going to be taking some temperature scans. And before you go, wait, wait, wait. No, I've seen you do this. I've seen you do this a million times. And yeah, I have. But there are a couple of things about this mission that makes it a little bit different than what you've seen before. Number one is this is the 50th mission of my uh, my campaign. So uh, that's a bit of a milestone, I think. Uh, and the second one I'll get to in just a little bit. But let's just talk about the video in general. I got a few things, quite a few things coming up in this particular episode, another episode chock full of Kerbaly goodness. Um, we are sending a probe out to Moho. Uh, I think that is uh, something of a little bit of significance. But why don't I get back to the Aristarchus here. Now the Aristarchus has made its way all the way over to that crater. Uh, you probably noticed the crater that's uh, it's, a, it's to the west of the Kerbal Space Center, well to the west, like probably like I don't know, over a thousand kilometers to the west. It's about a quarter of the way around the planet where these temperature scans are. And it was that quarter of way around the planet that got me thinking that this was a good mission to do something a little bit different. So uh, yeah, we're, we're first of all collecting our temperature scans the way we normally do and there's one that's going to have to be done on the surface. So after collecting the last aerial scan, Jeb heads on down to the surface and collects science the way he normally does. But this time we're going to be using the seismic uh, detector that we have here. Now you might be wondering, you may have noticed the seismic detector on uh, on previous missions before and that I've never really used it and that's because I have the interstellar mod installed and the interstellar mod changes the way this seismic detector works. The way it works is you can't just collect science, you can't just click on it and collect science. What you have to do is you have to start it recording and then you have to impact something against the surface and it's when it records the impact that's when you get the science and that is much more like how a real seismograph works, how, you know, how we really do use uh, vibrations uh, through a planet's core or through the planet's crust and core and through, to, uh, to detect its inner structure. So what we're going to do is we're going to come to a stop after collecting all of our science and then we're just going to start a recording. And then we're going to move on to another craft. Here we have the Archimedes. And the Archimedes, if you recall a few episodes ago, had a rather tragic crash that cost the lives of two of our Kerbals. But since then, it has been much improved. And I'm hoping that this newer version will, uh, will perform a little bit better for us. Now what the Archimedes is good at is cruising at high altitudes and at high speeds. Uh, but there is a limit, and here I was probably paying a little bit too much attention to playing around with the interior, uh, and when I came out I realized that, uh, yeah, I was getting some significant heating effects. I was a little too low and going a little bit too fast, and uh, yeah, things get scary here, and I'm trying to pitch up, pitch up, pitch up, pitch up, trying to slow down and get into a bit of a thinner air, but I wasn't quite fast enough. And uh, I didn't know at first what it was that was exploded. I certainly didn't hope it was anything important. And what it turned out to be was a circular air intake I had mounted at the front. The funny thing is, is that uh, the amount of air that this thing was pulling in didn't seem to really change noticeably at all after that thing exploded. So I guess it wasn't really necessary. The, uh, the, the large ones that are mounted, the radio ones that are mounted towards the back of the plane seem to be doing a more than adequate job. So I think in the future I might replace that with a more sturdier nose cone, make this a little less scary. Now that was actually a good thing uh, to happen the way it did because that's a good lesson for me as I start thinking about building shuttles and building space planes and having to bring those back into the atmosphere. That was a good sort of a limit test to just how fast 
at what altitude I can go. But here you can see I'm still, the, the Archimedes is performing admirably. It's cruising at 25 kilometers at uh, 1,000 meters per second and with very little drama whatsoever. But let's get on to the mission. The mission of the Archimedes is to land at the North Polar Ice Cap. So here we are, we're coming into our landing and we're going to collect ourselves some science. There's actually quite a lot of science to collect here because I've yet to be to the North Polar Ice Cap. But this is being done in conjunction with what the Aristarchus did. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to start the uh, seismic detector. We're going to start it recording. And so now if you think about it, I got the uh, Aristarchus uh, at the... Um, at that uh, crater, that big crater that's on Kerman. That crater must have a name. I don't know what it is though, but it's it's you know far to the west of Kerman, about a quarter of the planet uh, that way. And now we have the uh, Archimedes close to the North Pole, so that's about a quarter of the way around the planet from the Kerbal Space Center, but towards the north. And completing our trifecta, we have Bob in the Alhazen back at the KSC. And, you know, I kind of, I, I realized I spent so much time talking about the Archimedes, I didn't talk about her brave pilots. Uh, our, our pilot was Manuki with her co-pilot, one of our newer uh Kerbals, you haven't seen uh, her yet, is uh, Jean Mall. And uh, Jean Mall is, if I have this right, I believe she is an engineer. Yes, I hired another engineer because if you, you might call that uh, Bill is now floating around in our space station. So I need to get another engineer in case I needed an engineer. But anyway, here I have Bob our scientist, and he's uh, cruising around in his favorite vehicle. He's the only one that's ever driven this thing, and he's going to pick up uh, some main science, but the main part of his mission is to start that seismic sensor to give us three, three seismic centers, uh, sensors, one at KSC, one very close to the North Pole, and one at a crater. And these uh, sensors are all situated about a quarter of a way uh, around the planet from each other. And now all we need is an impactor, and the impactor is going to be this uh, transfer stage this is from the Hipparchus station module that, if you recall last episode, uh, we had our first crew of the space station uh, bring back to life, but I didn't deorbit it because I had this plan in mind already. Now when you deorbit these things, you do have to make sure, I'm pretty sure you do have to make sure that it lands onto a um, body of land. Uh, if it lands in the water, I don't think it's going to work. So you want to um, aim for a large uh, piece of land and, and make sure you're going to hit it. And then it's simply a matter of following it down. And you have to follow it down until it actually impacts. Don't just leave it and let KSC uh, remove it because what will end up happening is, uh, sorry, KSP will re will just remove it once it gets below a certain altitude and it won't record an impact. You have to follow it down for it to impact. And um, the, the reason why I placed these things the way they are is the seismic detector with the interstellar mod installed doesn't work uh, on a biome basis. It doesn't work with biomes. You don't go to different biomes and do it. But what it does do is it gives you more science the further apart you space them. And ideally, you want to space them so that they're all 90 degrees from each other. They all represent sort of a different axis. One's along an x-axis, one's along a y-axis, and one's along the z-axis. Um, and if you place them in, the, in sort of the way I did there, you will maximize your science return. And in fact, once you do this once, the amount of science that you get off of this thing on any particular body afterwards doesn't make it worth your while. So here we are. We're just about to impact. And once we impact, we can get the message that an impact has been recorded and we can now go collect our science. Now, Bob, of course, he's simple enough. He's already at the uh, Kerbal Space Center. I mean, I might as well drive him over to the runway just to get 100% return. Um, and Jeb, Jeb, well, Jeb is Jeb. He doesn't mind. He, one, another excuse to fly, well, that's all he wants. So uh, off he goes. He's on his way back home. And then it's up to Manuki and Gene Mall to get themselves home as well. But, uh, well, this one turns into a little bit more of an adventure. Now I'm going to apologize in advance for my frame rate issues. You've probably noticed them on other videos. 
Um, but here it gets it gets pretty bad, and this was actually the last nail in the coffin that got me thinking. I I, I really need to do something about it. It's sort of funny that um, you know while I'm playing, I don't really notice it at all. But definitely in the recording, there are frames that are being dropped as it's recording. So after this, do a little bit of changing in the graphics settings, and I think you will notice a significant difference. But anyway, here we are coming into the runway, and I wouldn't be showing you this if it didn't if it all went normally so you know it's not going to and the problem here is is that I'm I'm precariously close to the stall speed of this particular aircraft and once an aircraft gets below its stall speed well it doesn't have enough lift to hold it up anymore and it's just going to fall but I was a little bit what I should have done is just fired up and tried again but uh, uh, I decided to kind of go with it anyway and I hit a little bit hard and oh I'm why oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's just crazy, but uh, it, somehow nothing broke, and yeah, we're going backwards, but uh, yeah, well, well, we're down. There you go. A little dizzy, but we're down. <laughs> Here we have the Aldin Altusi on its way to low carbon orbit, and the mission is to go to Moho and just to do a flyby. That's the only that's the that's the mission altogether. Um and and I'm I gotta be honest, I'm a little bit disappointed with this particular craft. I had hoped by this point that I would have had the electric ion drives uh for uh, unlocked. But unfortunately I wasn't able to unlock them in time to get this thing built in time in order to meet the launch window to get itself to Moho and um, the reason why the electric engines are so nice is because the ISP on them is so high and so you can build relatively small spacecrafts with quite a lot of Delta V. If we're going to Moho you're going to need the Delta V. Uh, this thing has about 4.5 kilometers per second of Delta V once it loses its ascent stage and um, that's enough to get it to Moho and deal with sort of the worst case scenario of um, possible inclination changes uh, and that's not enough in order to achieve an orbit and it certainly isn't enough to get even consider achieving a landing. Yeah, Moho's a tough one um, and, and, and if you're going to be doing your first planetary mission definitely Moho's not the way to go. You want to go to Duna or you want to go to Eve but not to Moho. There are a number of things that make Moho more of a challenge than planets like Duna or Eve or even Jewel. Um, one is that it is a pretty small target to hit. Number two is that its orbit is fairly eccentric, so trying to predict the actual exact amount of delta V it requires to get there, um, it, it can be a little bit variable. Number three is that it its orbit is fairly highly inclined, so you're going to have to very likely make uh, some significant correction burns on your way there. Uh, and But number four, the biggest one, is its proximity to the sun. The proximity to the sun makes it an expensive planet to have to get to because you have to slow yourself down. Remember, you're going quite quickly. Just Kerbin's going quite quickly, and you have to lose a lot of that speed in order to get yourself to drop down to such a low orbit close to the sun. And this is the way it is with Moho's real-life counterpart, Mercury. I mean, we've had probes land on Venus, we've had probes land on Mars, we have probes land on Titan, asteroids, even in last fall, a probe landed on a comet. Yet, we have not had probes land on Mercury, and in fact, only two probes have even traveled towards Mercury, and only one of those achieved an orbit. There was the Mariner mission, Mariner 10, that did a flyby of Mercury, um, and then there was the, and that was in the early 70s, and then in the early 2000s there was the Messenger spacecraft, which did achieve an orbit around Mercury, and those are the only two missions. Mercury's a tough planet to get to. Um, both of those missions, by the way, used EVE, as a gravity assist to get to, or not Eve, what am I talking about? I'm mixing them up. They used Venus to get a gravity assist to get to uh, Mercury. And in fact, um, the Messenger spacecraft used Eve several times to get a gravity assist towards Mercury. And Eve, Venus again. But I'm thinking about Eve because you can actually use Eve very effectively as a gravity assist to get yourself to not just Moho, but to other planets as well. 
Uh, Eve is very well placed to do gravity assists from. The problem that I have though with Eve is, well, Eve's launch window is still quite some time away and Moho's launch window is right now and I'm playing sort of a timed game with Kerbal construction time so I'm going to just take advantage of the window that I have right now. So now with our orbit achieved, it is time to plan our escape burn. Now Moho has an orbit that is lower than Kerbin's orbit. So what we need to do is place our maneuver node on the leading edge of Kerbin so that when we burn prograde, our escape trajectory is going to be in a retrograde direction relative to Kerbin. And right away, the maneuver node is coming up in only a few seconds. So I'm going to use this advance the orbit button was added a couple of versions ago so that I don't cross over the maneuver node while I'm still planning it out. And of course it's the same old thing, just like what we did with Duna, we, we start burning prograde. And we want to pay attention to where our apoapsis is. So we select it and uh, yeah, we just keep burning prograde until we get down to where um, orbit of Moho is. And right away I'm starting to notice something that is going to work to my advantage. If you look at where the ascending and descending nodes are, I believe it's the ascending node that's right down there by Moho's orbit. That is a great thing um, when you have that because what that means is, is at that spot where the ascending node is, the my trajectory and Moho's orbit are, is crossing. So if I can get my encounter to happen there, I will have to do very little in the way of inclination change. And that will save me quite a bit of fuel. And so here we are, we just got our uh, encounter indicators there. And I can see from the indicators that I am arriving there too early. I am ahead of the target. But that, of course, is not a problem. All I have to do is move the maneuver node forward in time. And the best way to do that is to take advantage of these advanced orbit buttons. They're a little bit finicky. The node has a tendency to want to kind of disappear as you're using this, but you don't want to actually move the node around because it's in pretty much the position you want it to be for your escape trajectory. All you want to do is move it forward uh, or a single orbit at a time and as you do that you're moving forward in terms of days and every once in a while I lose my encounter indicator so I have to tweak a little bit uh, with the prograde burn but uh, eventually I end up getting my encounter. So there we have it we have a about a 1.5 kilometer per second burn in about six and a half days so there's nothing else to do but to wait for that burn so we're gonna set an alarm uh, to sort of remind us of when this burn is coming so that we can go ahead and do some other things. Now I I'm gonna say right here um, getting a single burn encounter to Moho is a pretty unusual thing to be able to do. And it only happened because of the luck that I had with where the ascending and descending nodes were. Almost always you have to do a correction burn mid-course and sometimes those correction burns can be quite expensive. That's why I packed so much Delta V into this thing. But it turns out that I'm going to have about three kilometers per second left after this burn is done. So that's going to leave me with some options when I get there. Um, so yeah, I'll have to explore those after I do the burn. Now I'm showing you here, uh, I got a little bit of Infernal Robotics happening. That's another mod I have in installed. Uh, I think this is the first time I've used it. This is a really simple thing. I just have this antenna on the end of a telescoping piston and then there's a hinge, a small hinge at the end of the piston to turn the antenna and I don't know, it was a nice way to kind of hide the antenna in the fairing and allow myself to deploy it so it kind of looks all right and of course I'm going to point this thing at Kerbin and as you may recall from my Duna mission uh, once this thing gets out past the Kerbin sphere of influence uh, I will not be able to communicate with it because I don't have any other antennas that are capable of reaching out that far that mission is in the building queue. It is coming up soon, I promise. Of course, we're going to be taking the time to do a few more missions. Now, all of these missions are of pretty routine type, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with them. Here we have the Alhazen, and driving the Alhazen is one of our new Kerbals, Looney. Looney is a scientist, and she is out trying to scrounge a little bit more science 
out of the Kerbal Space Center uh, areas. Um, and again, remember, this is a completely free mission, and it doesn't take long to build this car. Again, uh, it's free because it costs no fuel whatsoever, and I get 100% recovery. Well, actually, this one doesn't turn out to be quite free because it, the vehicle doesn't quite come back unscathed. Moving on quickly, we come to Junksat 10. Now, Junksat 10 is one of these missions, these satellite missions, where you need to put this satellite, this one required a goo container, but that's no big deal, uh, and put it into a specific orbit around Kerbin. The only interesting thing that happened with this particular mission is that I forgot to put one of those Kerbal Engineer chips onto the satellite, so I don't have access to Kerbal Engineer, so here I am kind of old schooling it using the map view to circularize um, my orbit. I mean that was one of the things that always attracted me to Kerbal Engineer when I first discovered it was how much less time you end up spending in map view. But anyway, of course, things go perfectly fine. Uh, we, we get it out to orbit, we uh, do our orbit that we want, we circularize it out there and the contract gets finished off. And now we get to meet our third new hire. Yeah, it's, it's, it, this is all because uh, we have those uh, Kerbals now up in the Parkus station that we got to start, you know, beefing up our ranks to replace them. So this is Robble, and Robble clearly has something to prove. Now, obviously, she is a pilot, and uh, she needs to. She's sending Jeb a message here. I think she is sending Jeb the message that watch out. There's a new girl in town. Uh, I, can, I can fly these things just as well as you can. Robble, of course, is in the Aristarchus, and she's out doing these one of these pressure scan um, missions. And uh, here she is. She's just coming in for the final landing at the final location, trying to avoid the trees, even though, I mean, I, I know full well you can't crash into these trees. All of the ground scatter textures are just textures. There's no collision detection associated with them, but at the same time, I don't want to fly through a tree you know yeah that, that kind of spoils the whole illusion so we're not gonna we're not gonna hit the tree but not only does she avoid uh, landing the tree or hitting any of the trees she puts this thing right down on the money one of the calmest landings I have yet to see uh, hats off to our new pilot And now comes the time for us to perform our transfer burn to Moho. And while we're performing this burn, or I suppose more correctly, while the flight computer from Remote Tech is performing this burn, why don't we talk a little bit about Nasir Aldin Altusi, after whom this vessel has been named. Altusi was a 13th century Persian polymath. Um, by polymath, what that means is he did a lot of stuff. Of biology, chemistry, physics, uh, logic and philosophy and mathematics. Uh, he wrote actually the definitive Arabic versions of uh, many of the Greeks works like Euclid and Archimedes and Ptolemy and uh, you know this transcribing from uh, ancient tests to modern tests, that, that, that is very very important in, in the kind of the historical preservation of these texts. If there weren't people like him doing these things, we would never even be aware of the works of these people. And it's thanks to people transcribing these things all the time that, uh, that, that, that as many texts as do survive to the modern day. But what I really want to focus on is con his contributions to astronomy, this being Kerbal Space Program, and uh, what he ended up doing was establishing the most accurate astronomical tables for the positions of the stars and the motions of the planets uh, that existed at the time and improved upon Ptolemy's model uh, to, for predicting positions of planets and solar events. Um, he also recognized that the Milky Way uh, was actually composed of many tightly packed faint stars, something that wasn't proved until Galileo pointed his telescope that way uh, centuries later. So yes, indeed, a very important figure in the history of science. And with that complete, it's time to see what I can do with this extra three kilometers per second of delta V that I still have left in this thing. So the first thing is to plan a little bit of a correction burn so I can tweak my encounter a little bit. So I bring the periapsis uh, down as close to, or my closest approach, as close as I can to Moho because that would be the 
best place in which to affect um, the trajectory of my craft. And the first thing I'm going to shoot for is to see if I can get a capture. So I'm going to go see if this is going to work. And it turns out that no. Unfortunately, capture takes a little bit over 3.1 kilometers per second in order to, to, to get that. So I just don't have quite enough fuel in order to pull that one off. So the capture is unfortunately out of the question. Uh, my next idea was to see if I can use Moho to affect my trajectory and encounter Eve. So for that, I'm going to need to use Moho to uh, slow myself down. Now, this is not the best way in which to do this. Moho is pretty small and doesn't affect your trajectory all that much. It's much, much easier to use Eve to affect your trajectory to go to Moho than the other way around. But nevertheless, it can be done. And the best place, of course, to perform the burn to try and hit Eve is going to be, again, at uh, the closest approach to Moho. But unfortunately, that one doesn't pull off well, come out too well as uh, to to uh, comes out as well because Eve just isn't positioned correctly. The two um, the encounter markers here you can see are way too far apart for me to tweak an encounter out of this. So I'm not going to be able to to get this to go to Eve. I've done that in the past, but this time it just it just isn't going to work. So I'm down to my third option, which is going to be to affect my orbit. So I end up with an orbit with a period that is about twice as uh, long as the orbital period of MOHO. And what this will end up doing is allowing this craft to come back to MOHO uh, after a complete orbit around the sun. So I'll do a flyby, and then I'll be able to do multiple flybys after that. Now, there'll be a good uh, length of time between each of those flybys but uh, yeah, that's okay. That's the best that I can do out of this situation. And it is actually not too dissimilar from what the original Mariner 10 did when it went by uh, Mercury. It, it did these multiple passes as well. Anyway, that's going to end it for this video, and we will see you next time.